just move that out of the way. Great. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for the intro. I um, uh, hope you're having a great day so far and not had the torrential rain that I've just had coming through here. It's been like a, a massive storm. Um, firstly, just want to thank, say thanks for signing up to this talk and thanks to Joanna for inviting me. I'm um, really excited to talk to you all today and just share a little bit about my career so far and hopefully have an interesting chat about working in data, everyone. So I thought the, the kind of logical place to start would be at the beginning. Um, so here's a little bit of a summary about me in one slide. So I'm a physicist by training. I did a degree in physics and then I did a PhD in astrophysics studying distant galaxies at Durham University. Um, so yeah, this is a picture of me at the VLT, the, the very large telescope, would you believe it, in Chile. Um, getting very excited about using those telescopes and collecting lots of uh, a different type of data than I use now. Um, and then around five years ago, I decided to make the switch into data science. I uh, joined co-op as a junior data scientist. Really grateful to get that opportunity to join at sort of um, junior level. And then now I'm a senior data scientist specializing in uh, personalization and our membership at co-op. So yeah, at the time when I joined five years ago, I'll be honest, I really didn't know anything much at all about data science. I kind of knew a few friends who'd made the similar change, you know, similar transition from astrophysics into data science. Um, so that gave me a little bit of confidence, but I still didn't know a lot. Um, what I did know is that I knew I loved finding creative solutions, to difficult problems. So that was kind of a, a theme throughout my PhD that as a scientist, problems didn't tend to have one right answer. You know, it was more just poking at things and exploring them and seeing what I could find out. Um, I really liked coding and applying all kinds of analytical techniques, you know, using maths and statistics. I loved and I was also really passionate about science communication, going into schools and like presenting at conferences. So adapting my message to different audiences. So I think that's another theme in data science that's really important. So I have to communicate with a lot of different people um, throughout co-op. So yeah, um, flashback here to fresh faced little um, science nerd arriving at co-op HQ on my first day for you know, starting my first real job in the real world outside of academia. And yeah, honestly, it was a little bit of a culture shock at first. I basically didn't know anything about retail, apart from buying lots of Ben and Jerry's and running shoes. I didn't know what SQL was. Um, I could code, but in a different language than we typically used in data science at co-op. And yeah, like the, the corporate acronyms completely bamboozled me. It made me feel a little bit stupid that I didn't know all of these different things that people were talking about. And at first I kind of worried that I've made a big mistake. I was like, oh no, I should have stayed in astronomy where I was comfortable and I knew everyone. Um, and I kind of knew what to expect there. This is a whole different thing for me. It was a yeah, bit of a shock. But thankfully, you know, a few months on, I, I soon settled in and started to feel like I was at home at co-op. Um, and nowadays, you know, it's I'm just like so proud to work there. I love that we have really strong ethics and values as a business. We're not just out to make tons of money from people. Um, I like working in a really big company with loads of opportunities, meet, you know, people from really varied roles across the business. Um, and yeah, personally, I think I find a, a role that really suits me as well. I've got a lot of challenge and, and like diversity in what I do um, day to day. So sometimes I'll be, you know, obviously doing a lot of coding as data scientist, but sometimes communicating results to stakeholders or thinking more about the kind of commercial impact of my work and how it fits into the wider co-op strategy. So, yeah, I think that's what I really like about it, the variety. So um, having said that, um, just a little summary about data science at co-op and our team and where we sit within the wider business. So there are around 400 people, I believe, within digital data and technology, so that encompasses all the different types of roles. And within that, we're a close-knit data science team of eight people, soon to be nine, but more on that later, a bit of a spoiler for the end of my talk, I'll tell, tell you more about that position opening up. Um, we're quite lucky in that we have a bit of a, uh, you know, a mature, sophisticated, whatever you want to call it, data ecosystem. All of our data now, well, pretty much all of our data is in the cloud. 
um, the data that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, so at least it's all in the cloud. Um, and we use Azure tools to manage our work. So um, you might have heard of Databricks or Azure DevOps, those kind of tools that we use. And for a small team, I think we punch way above our weight. Um, we work on projects right across the business that have big impact. Um, and just to give you a kind of flavor of the things that we do on the next few slides. So um, most of you will probably have heard of co-op and you know seen the food stores and that's what you're familiar with. And we do have 2,500 approximately food stores um, across the UK, but we also offer services in insurance, in funeral care and legal advice. So yeah, depending what you're working on um, as a data scientist, like you can be doing completely different things um, yeah, so it's a, a lot of variation there. Um, so yeah, to dive a little bit deeper on that, I'll just give you some examples of the kind of projects that we work on within data science. So uh, up on the te top left there, we've got um, a daily bake plan for bakery and hot food. So these are things that are produced in store on a daily basis, fresh for customers. And we created as a data science team, some um, basically a plan that people can view on an iPad or print out or wherever it might be a plan for how much of each product they should bake in a day. Um, just to automate that decision making and make things more efficient for the colleagues that we have in store. Um, I was involved with, with some of those projects. Also got uh, membership personalization, as I've mentioned, if any of you have the co-op app, that's kind of a little bit of what's involved in that. There's far more to it, but that's a, a little part of it. Um, thinking about pricing and promotions, um, making sure that the right products are on the right shelves at the right time. Um, yeah, things like allocating space within stores and also things like planning demand for funerals. So obviously that was particularly important in the last few years, uh, unfortunately. So yeah, real variety. Those are only a couple of the, the different projects that we had going on um, within data science, far more behind the scenes. Um, and I really like this graphic. I kind of stole this from our SharePoint website. Um, so basically, generally speaking, there are four different types of analytics that go on within co-op. Um, so you have the kind of why did the what what happens is the very sort of basic level, you know, just figuring out what happens. Then you've got why did it happen, and then uh, trying to predict what will happen next. And how can we make it happen? So just thinking a bit more strategically. And um, on that graph, basically data science lies in the predictive and prescriptive analytics areas. So things that are involved with, you know, maybe they're projects that span months to years and that drive more long-term planning for the business. Those are the bits that we're most involved with. Um, so yeah, as I touched on earlier, my work for the past year has focused more on the membership and personalization side. So every Monday, if you've got if you've got the app, um, you'll get eight new offers um, on your phone. There'll be a combination of deals on your favorite products, your favorite brands that you've bought before, and also some money off brands that we think that you might like. So recommendations within that. And it's a, a really powerful tool. So there's all sorts of this. This is only part of the app. This is only one page. There's so much more to it. But it's basically just a really powerful tool to drive member engagement and to get to know our customers better and to be able to just like, you know, give them um, give them offers that are personalized to them and make them feel um, like we're kind of catering to them on a personal level. But yeah, it's no easy feat. So we've got about a million active members on the app per week that we have to provide offers for. Oh no, I haven't fixed. There's more than <laughs> more than 1,017 possible combinations. That's meant to be um, 10 to the 17 possible combinations. So way bigger than that. So many different combinations. Um, that was me trying to figure it out in, in Keynote how to edit my slide. I must've given up. <laughs> um, yeah, and so this is kind of the work that I do, figuring out which offers we want to give to which members. And it's, yeah, it's been my favorite for the past year because I get to work with colleagues from right across the business. I work with people in sort of membership teams, insight, analytics, digital, CRM, all kinds of exciting people. 
And it just feels really nice, I think, to make a change. And then a few weeks later, you actually see the impact of that change. You know that it's really close to um, the customers. And I can have a little sneaky glance on my phone. You know, I can open up the app and know that I've contributed to that. And I'm actually doing something that's having a, yeah, like a more of a tangible impact. So it's really fun. So now that you've got to know um, me a little bit, what do I want to talk to you about today? So yeah, <laughs> rewind a couple of months. Um, Joanna invited me to give a talk. And I was super excited, you know, I was really flattered. I was like, yeah, definitely, you know, replied back straight away on Teams, like, sure, I'll give a talk, that, that sounds amazing. But, you know, suddenly it was getting closer and closer and I was getting a little bit more terrified of what should I talk about? I realized that I'd actually have to write something and prepare something. Um, so yeah, I was a little bit scared. So despite working in data science for five years, this is the first kind of public talk I've given um, outside of, talking to school children and doing science communication bits and pieces. So what I decided on in the end was that I would give the talk that I basically wish I'd seen back in 2018 when I was just starting out and just give a flavor of some of the lessons that I've learned along the way in the past five years, some of the valuable advice that I've received from other people. Um, yeah, just a few little hints and tips and hopefully you can add your own as well and we can have a little chat at the end. So I'm going to split this um, into a couple of different sections. And the first one is what I've learned about projects and kind of the core data science work. Lesson number one, um, I am never going to know everything about data science. <laughs> this was a bit of a hard one at first. Um, you know, I was that sort of nerdy kid who wanted to get 100% on every test that she did growing up, a real kind of type A personality, like very competitive. Um, and after my PhD, I just immersed myself in all sorts of online courses, you know, uh, data camp courses, wanted to know everything there was to know about every single algorithm, all the terminology, you know, to be a complete expert in things before I actually, you know, got my first role. But I soon realized that data science is evolving just so rapidly that it's impossible to do this. You know, there's always going to be things that you don't know about and you're always going to be a little bit behind the curve. So. Um, yeah, the best way that I found to learn is to just kind of dive in, get stuck and Google things a lot, or nowadays ask ChatGPT, I suppose, about how to do things. But um, that said, here are a couple of my favorite resources if you were to start out in data science. So there's a fantastic book by Jake van der Plaas, who by complete coincidence used to be an astronomer as well. Um, StatQuest, they've got an amazing YouTube channel and a, a little book to go along with that. And um, there's all sorts of online courses, like Data Camp is one of my favorite ones because it's quite practical and hands-on, but it's also like Coursera and Kaggle. Um, plenty of materials out there. Um, the second lesson for me was, yeah, another pretty big one, but that perfectionism is my biggest weakness. I think this is probably true in data science, but other areas of data as well, and like other, no matter what career you're in, I think this is probably a big one. So in, when I worked in academia, projects tended to last kind of probably years for, for my papers to get papers out. Um, and it was quite rare, really, that I presented unfinished work. You'd want to go to a conference and say, look at this fantastic thing that I've done. And, you know, it's all great. And the paper's going to be out soon. So I, um, I kind of got into data science and I was junior data scientist, quite ambitious. And I wanted to impress people. I wanted to look smart. I'm basically just trying to do everything all at once. <laughs> um, but over time, I've realized that, you know, in retail especially, we just need to be able to move quickly a lot of the time. You know, you don't need to have th something that's completely perfect and polished. Sometimes it's just more important about getting things out and getting some kind of result and then building on that. So the best advice I've had around this is that it's much better to just focus on delivering work in small batches kind of um, continuous improvement. So just, yeah, one thing that builds on another, builds on another and like piecing things up. So it's little chunks of work that will add value continuously. Um, essentially just rather than trying to change the world one PR at a time, um, just think, you know, what is the like the smallest change that I can make to make this project better? 
And I love this quote from um, someone who I did a, um, an agile course recently online. Um, that was facilitated by some people at the co-op. It was fantastic. Um, you can find that free on YouTube. But this quote was, um, the best measure of productivity is how fast we can learn. And I think that is just so true. Um, building from that, uh, I think, yeah, this whole sort of theme is something that I'm still working to get better at. So I was listening to this Squiggly Careers podcast recently. It's um, They've got all kinds of resources on there, like literally hundreds of episodes. But this episode, When Good Enough is Great. And I think they have some like really amazing practical tips um, that have helped me to kind of continue to have this at the front of my mind in whatever I'm doing at the time. So the first one was to set a date when you're going to stop and share your work with other people. And they said, you know, don't wait until you're like 90% done with a project. Make sure that you're sharing it when you're maybe like 60 or 70% done. And then it helps other people to feel involved. You know, you're sharing with people, you can get feedback um, and you might come up with a better solution that way. The second tip was to take things really back to basics. And that's what I was saying before. So just figure out what is the the sort of plan on a page what is the simplest possible way to achieve this goal or like a minimum viable product if that's what the kind of language that you tend to use um so some of the tools that we use in our team at co-op to do this and kind of try and fight the perfectionist urge is that we have weekly techie time sessions so this is just a name for basically sharing our work um, usually on a Thursday afternoon, someone from the team will present a piece of work that they've done. Um, you know, it tends to be a work in progress or maybe just something that they found, you know, like a, this is a new tool. I've had a little play with it. Maybe you'll go off and experiment with it. And yeah, just trying to fight the idea that it needs to be perfect to show it to other people. We have at least one other data scientist to bounce ideas off of. So we tend to work in pairs. Maybe not directly, but just within the project, we'll be doing different things. And then we can check in with each other and just say, hey, what do you think about this? Or I'm a bit stuck. Um, just keeps the conversation open. And yeah, this is a, a really important one is keeping those pull requests small. So I had a habit. Well, I still have a bit of a habit of doing this, but sometimes you get a bit carried away, right? And you have all of these ideas that you put into one big pull request and then you like, you know, slams down on someone's desk that they have to review it. And I think it's far more productive if we can try and discipline ourselves a little bit to keep those changes small. And so you're just making like regular changes that are moving things along a little bit. Um, and yeah, it's easier both on the reviewer and on, on you because <laughs> there's less work to do at once. And then finally, just um, having a bit of an openness in our team of when things go wrong, when we find a bug, when we, you know, maybe try to fit a particular model and it just doesn't work out, just sharing that with each other. I think it's really helpful. Um, another way that we do this and apply this way of working is to just try new ideas out on a smaller scale first. So with um, in-store bakery and hot food forecasting, this looked like um, doing tests and doing trials with a specific subset of stores before we took it, you know, to all 2000 plus stores um, rather than just embarrass ourselves by getting it all wrong, trying to do it all at once. Um, and then with personalized offers as well, we trial things on a regular basis with a subset of members. So yeah, they won't necessarily know about it. It's just little tweaks behind the scene. Um, but we're currently running a series of two week long AB tests. So that is where, yeah, some subset of members will get just the original version of the code, the current version that we have in production. And then the other subset of members will get a slightly tweaked, slightly, maybe slightly improved, or we hope it's improved version. And sometimes it goes wrong, you know? <laughs> sometimes it's good to just try things out and just, just see how it performs with maybe like 20% of people or something. And then at least you know. Um, I like this, <laughs> this quote on the left here from Twisted Doodles, which is saying, if at first you don't succeed, Try two more times so that your failure is statistically significant. That's kind of like my mantra for life. <laughs> I had this above my desk in my PhD as well. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a thing to go by. And finally, um, in terms of project work, at least, um, sometimes the simplest solution is actually the best solution. 
So I've got down below there, it's not my job to look clever. Um, oh, typo, sorry about that. <laughs> it's my job to deliver value. So yeah, well, maybe that's my not being a perfectionist. There's a typo in there, maybe deliberately. Um, yeah, so neural networks are great and all, but sometimes, you know, we've got limited resources, limited time. Um, it's important to be able to explain our work to stakeholders sometimes. So you don't want to, you know, sometimes you have to just break things down and explain exactly what's going on under the hood. Sometimes it's, you know, not this necessary, but sometimes it is. Um, and sometimes you can just make a change that maybe gets you 80% of the way with like 20% of the effort. So it's not worth putting in all that extra time, you know, all those extra months work worth of agonizing over bits of code if you can get most of the way quite quickly with a simple solution. Um, and in, yeah, this is quite true in like personalized offers at the moment, the work that I'm doing, sometimes you can make a really, really tiny code change and it will have a massive impact. Literally, very recently, I changed one of the hyperparameters in one of the models that I was running just change like a, a number in the code from like a two to a three um, or whatever it, might, whatever it might have been. And we literally had about a 30% increase in the number of people who were redeeming a type of offer. So yeah, like it can be really simple things that have a massive impact. You don't always anticipate that. Um, also one of the projects that I did very early on in my career um, as a junior data scientist, it was just using um, simple kind of area under the curve calculations, like simple integrals. And it actually had like, you know, made loads of money for the business. And it was it's still one of the projects that I'm proudest of. Um, even though, you know, you think data science has to be fancy machine learning models, has to be neural networks. It has to be really complicated. A lot of times the simple stuff still is the best. So next up. I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about careers in general and just some of the advice that I've had along the way. Um, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned when it comes to careers is that um, career progression isn't really linear anymore. It's kind of quite common for people to jump from career to career um, and like not just have one single job throughout their lifetime. I think it's going to be really true for our generation. Um, so in our team, we have people from a range of different backgrounds. We have people like myself who are from more of a research background, um, people who have graduated just recently, maybe from like data science MSCs or from, um, at times it's been like people from undergrad degrees. Um, and yeah, maybe more of a commercial background as well. They've sort of found their way in data science. Um, we've also, yeah, like personally, I'm, I'm really happy where I am right now as well. So um, I don't want to move from data science to something else, but it's quite common within co-op that we've had colleagues who've, you know, moved from data engineering to data science. Um, hi, Mina, if you're on the call. <laughs> um, we've had data science to advanced analytics teams. Um, we've, I've also known friends who've gone from data science into project management. So yeah, there's basically no right way to have a career. I think essentially if you're if you're having fun like if you're happy and if you feel like you're learning something new and hopefully getting paid a decent amount as well um I think that's like you know ticks all the boxes it doesn't really matter that your CV has some perfect trajectory from you know this role to this more senior role to this more senior role I think just exploring your interests and it does give a bit of a competitive edge as well um I think it was really beneficial to me to have that PhD background even though you know, no one in my day to day asks me, oh, Helen, can you tell me about spiral galaxies? Um, I still think I picked up a lot of transferable skills and a lot of valuable experience. And that's um, certainly true for the people that I know who've moved into data science from other fields as well. Um, obviously, it's a bit uncomfortable at first, like I was saying at the beginning of my talk, um, just but but like everything is uncomfortable, right? There's always going to be new technologies there's always going to be a new role that you're moving into or a new project that you're working on I think it's just yeah just like embracing all those opportunities and trying lots of different things um the next thing that I wanted to talk about is just the fact that data science is a relatively new field 
So the role of a data scientist, even though you might see loads of job adverts for data scientists on LinkedIn, um, they're actually very, very different roles depending on which industry they're in and which um, company they're with. So you might be familiar with this chart on the left where it describes, um, I'm just going to love to see this, but um, this describes sort of the perfect data scientist as being a combination of all these different skills. So like communication skills, statistics and machine learning, programming, um, and like business acumen. And the idea is that, yeah, right at the very heart there, you've got like the perfect data scientist. But <laughs> I think in my view, at least, there's no perfect data scientist. And um, I kind of the way that I see it is that everyone has different skills in different areas and maybe is slightly stronger in some of these little bubbles than others. Um, this is quite a simplified view as well. There's like so much more to data science than just this. But I think, you know, some people are maybe better at the communication piece, um, maybe like the business strategy. Others are like experts in the coding and software engineering type area of data science um, or the ins and outs of machine learning models or data engineering. I think within our team, we, even though there's just eight of us, we've all got quite different backgrounds and different skills that we're like slightly better at and maybe slightly you know it's like you sort of still building our skills um that's true for me it's true for everyone but I think we all kind of work together well as a team and bring different things to the table so yeah like makes us better as a whole I think the key is to just really like find out what your unique strengths are and just yeah own them <laughs> it's really cheesy but just kind of yeah find out what you're good at own that and then yeah work on the other things obviously not just neglecting them but just appreciating that you have a maybe unique skill set and you can contribute in different ways the next part I think is really important so my third tip is all just about um all about just building ex uh, building relationships with other people so some people really hate meetings but I honestly think that are some of my favorite parts of my day I always learn something new when I'm chatting with other people um, and I think, yeah, it's probably the best way to learn to tap into the knowledge around you and just kind of ask other people what they're doing and how they would maybe make something better, do something a bit differently. Um, and also, yeah, no one is going to know about the great work that you're doing unless you tell them. I think this is something that's maybe overlooked slightly. That you kind of assume that everyone knows what you're up to. But if you don't tell them, you know, they might have some great tip of how you can do something better or they might say, oh, I'm really familiar with that data set. I think it's worth just talking to people and just getting to know people. Um, in co-op within data, digital and technology, um, we have several different communities of practice. And I think these are really useful platforms for just getting to build those relationships with other people and networking with different teams. So we have, I think, um, a ways of working community of practice, there's one that's recently been set up on um, Azure tools using things like Databricks and talking to each other about the data that exists and the tools that exist within that environment. Um, and there's also an analytics community of practice as well. So there's all kinds of different opportunities that we have. And yeah, we're really lucky to have that. Um, and finally, if you know me, you know that I probably can't get through a talk or get through a day without mentioning Taylor Swift. So as she so nicely put it here, um, a big advocate for not hiding your enthusiasm for things. I think this is just 100% me as well. Um, don't be afraid to show your enthusiasm for things. I think it's been something that particularly I've leaned into over the last couple of years and it's just brought so many different opportunities. So I recently started to post on LinkedIn quite a bit and I was so nervous about doing this at first. I was like, what if people just hate what I write? You know, what if they think, like, who does she think she is posting on LinkedIn? <laughs> Her day is not that interesting. But it's given me loads of opportunities to improve my writing, to maybe share writing with different audiences. Um, it's brought diversity and inclusion work my way and volunteering opportunities. And then also, you know, through meeting different people in work at co-op and just talking to them about what I'm passionate about, saying, you know, I really love doing X, Y, Z. Um, they'll, you know, people will just send me opportunities and say, oh, hey, there's this course that's come up. This personal development opportunity has come up. 
um, or invite me to maybe speak about data science or have a conversation with someone about something that I'm working on. Um, yeah, I think it's just just really worth being passionate about the things that you're passionate about and just just talking about them. Don't feel like you kind of need an opportunity to just go for it. Um, and last but not least, love to talk a little bit about confidence. So finding my confidence has been a big theme for me over the past five years. Um, and I know as women or minorities in tech, we're often like kind of working within systems that weren't built for us and environments that weren't built for us. So sometimes it's easy to feel like a bit of an imposter, like you don't belong. But I saw this amazing quote recently from um, this um, lady who's written the book on the left. And she says that there's no magic amount of experience that will make you worthy of sharing your ideas with the world. I just thought that was just perfect. Um, it's just really true. I think there's no, yeah, like kind of with the LinkedIn piece that I was so afraid to start posting on there, so afraid to start just, yeah, sharing the things that I was passionate about. I was like kind of waiting until I had the right amount of experience. Or sometimes in meetings you think, oh, I'm, I'm not sure I really know enough to speak up here. But I think it's true that you just got to dive in and kind of say what you want to say. Um, yeah, I think there's there's always going to be times when we feel like the Teletubby in this meme, right? So you've got the Power Rangers and then the Teletubby putting us out on the top. And it's like, what are you doing here? Um, but yeah, sometimes you're going to feel like you don't belong or like you're kind of less worthy of being in an environment. And I feel like that all the time when I work with incredible people on a daily basis. But the best advice I had was from my manager recently that, you know, he pointed out that you don't necessarily need to have all of the answers if you're in a meeting. You know, we think that sometimes um, you have to go to a meeting prepared with all this knowledge and you kind of be the expert in a situation. But actually, sometimes when you're in these meetings, your role is just kind of the opposite is just to be enthusiastic to ask loads of questions and just approach things a little bit differently and yeah worth worth remembering like no matter how senior you are no matter how junior you are whether you've kind of worked in data science for a day or for 10 years I think you've got a really unique perspective on whatever you're talking about and you've always got something to contribute and yeah, I think another thing that's really helped my confidence that's had a big impact on my career has been mentoring. So from both angles, actually, um, I've had loads of people who have acted as role models, um, given their time to me to just teach me something or listen to me when I was having, you know, kind of worries about something. People who've put me forward for different opportunities or recommended me for something. Um, and I'm really lucky at co-op that we've got a formal mentoring and coaching program. So some of the mentors that I've had have come through that and other people have just been, you know, maybe managers or people that I've worked closely with. Um, but even if your business doesn't have kind of a formal mentoring program, I found that just reaching out to people and saying, you know, I'd really like your advice. I don't think many people are going to say no to that. Most people would be quite flattered about it. Um, so it's yeah, always worth just reaching out to people. And if you're more senior or even, I suppose, even if you're just starting out, maybe have a think about how you can pay it forward, how you can get involved with, with other things as well, you know, supporting people who are just coming into the industry. Because that, I think, is one of those things where you think as a mentor, it's a one-way relationship, you know, that you're giving them something. But I think it's both ways. I've worked with um, organizations such as Innovate Her, the Girls Network, and Tech Up Women who work through Durham University to help um, kind of under underrepresented groups get into tech. And I think all of those experiences have just been really, really positive for me, as well as for the people I was mentoring and the people I was teaching, because it, it gives you that confidence as well. And it's just really fun. <laughs> um, so if you'd like any more information about things like that, just let me know. I can post some more about that in the chat. Um, and yeah, also, if you struggle with confidence, this is a resource that I'd highly recommend. So I've recently been listening to Lauren Curry's podcast, um, following her on LinkedIn, and she's got a newsletter as well. She runs this group called Upfront. 
Um, and this is one of the quotes from her latest newsletter that I just absolutely loved. She says, every moment you're obsessed over people not liking you, not rocking the boat, not being a show off, whatever that means, um, you're like hindering your own progress. Like, no one else cares about that stuff. Or if they do, they're kind of not worth bothering with. <laughs> All right. So just, just like go out there and do your thing and try not to worry too much about what other people think. I think that's just great advice. Um, and finally, as I promised earlier, just wanted to share an exciting piece of news with you all that we're hiring for a junior data scientist at co-op. And you're actually possibly one of the first groups to know about this, I think. So I'll post the, the link for the, this webinar that's coming up in the chat in a minute, but just as an overview, I think um, this position would be ideal for you if maybe you've got a master's in data science or maybe you don't have direct data science experience, but you've got some knowledge of it. You maybe have done some online courses and you've got an enthusiasm for it and a background in some other kind of numerical coding type subjects. Or just generally, if you've got an inquisitive mind and you've got good communication skills, you're passionate about data, I think this is one for you. So we've got a webinar coming up where you can learn all about this and ask lots of questions on the 17th of May. So that's actually, that's next Wednesday, isn't it, I think? Um, so it's over lunchtime. You can find out about everything at that time. And applications will be opening on that same day. They'll be open for a week. Um, so I think if you're in doubt, just apply, just give it a go. Um, that, you know, don't underestimate yourself. Just put, a, put an application in and who knows what might happen. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a really great place to work. I've enjoyed it a lot the last few years. So um, thanks so much for having me. I've never done anything like this before and you can probably tell I was quite nervous because I just sped through all of my slides. <laughs> so I would love your feedback and you know any thoughts that you've got. Um, here's my kind of social accounts if you'd like to connect, if you'd like to continue having a chat about anything I've mentioned. And please like feel free to ask questions if you've got any questions about data at co-op or just anything I've mentioned. And um, Maybe if you've got any tips of your own as well, I'd love that.